He podcasts me. He podcasts me and I shall have him. I'll podcast him round the outer nebula, round Antares Maelstrom, and round petitioned flames before I give him up. For your geek history lesson on Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is now in session, session, session. Hello and welcome to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason God Inman. I was wondering how long that was going to take. I'm Ashley Victoria <laughs> Robinson. Welcome to I your mind university. Blasted everybody's <laughs> eardrums and I apologize. Somebody on a subway somewhere is screaming in pain. I could have gone much louder, um, but I didn't. I, I, I know that for a fact. What is this podcast, actually? Uh, well, you interrupted it. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the podcast where we take one character, construct, or Star Trek movie from popular culture and teach you everything you need to know about it in about an hour. That's right, friends. It's a movie retrospective episode. And uh, what are we doing and why, Jason? We are talking about Star Trek II colon... The Wrath of Khan. Star Trek 2 colon. Kirk yeah. is officially old. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek 2, the colonoscopy begins. Uh, no, uh, go check that. Go get checked out. Yeah, no, but sure. seriously. I'm yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, of course, the, uh, is it the, it's the 40th anniversary. Yes. yes. Yeah. Doing the yeah, math, yeah. right? It is yeah, the yeah, 40th yeah. anniversary yeah. of Star Trek 2, the Wrath of Khan. Uh, we love to celebrate movie anniversaries here. We just did Conan the Barbarian and all those various things. And Ashley and I are big Star Trek fans, so we thought we would dive deep into what a lot of people call the best Star Trek movie of all time. So I was going to ask if you want to talk about that, or do we want to dangle this in front of people? Oh. Go request it on at GHL Podcast and on Instagram at Geek History Lesson. You mean to do the best Star Trek movies of all time? Yeah, or top five, you know, to, to do a list Look, episode. Look, I will say this. We have, I thought, I think, talked about doing that episode more than once. I'm sure we have. And I think the reason why we've decided not to do it up to this point is because we know automatically that number one is going to be one of two movies. So for me, there <laughs> maybe three. There's I was going to say for there's me, three there's choices. three in the discussion, yeah. and uh, maybe if we did it, we would need a guest, someone to shake things up a little bit. Well, I think let's just say this. I think objectively, you mm -hmm. and I have talked about this. Objectively, if you were just looking at the merits of the talents. And the writing and the acting. And their influence on further future yep. Star Trek, yeah. I kind of think you have to say it's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. As I, the objectively best. I think objectively, but our lists are not <laughs> Yes. Yeah. It's not my favorite. Uh, it's not my favorite either. But I think objectively. But it's definitely, it's definitely in my like top. Yeah. It's definitely my top five. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's get into the 10 cent origin of this movie, Ashley. Yes, that is the first part of the podcast where Professor Jason is going to tell you all of the basic Suzits and what's its galore about Wrath of Khan in case you go to a cool Star Trek movie themed cocktail party and somebody hasn't seen this yet. No shame, honestly. The, the release date is June 4th, 1982. So uh, Wrath of Khan is a Gemini like myself. That's true. Uh, it was directed by Nicholas Meyer with a screenplay by Jack B. Sowards, a story by Harv Bennett and Jack B. Sowards. Harv Bennett, everybody, if you are a fan of Star Trek, is somebody that you should research he is responsible for this trilogy of movies he's a really important Star Trek. executive yeah. in the star trek world he is a big reason why wrath of khan happened the way it did and without harv bennett uh he recently passed away actually um without harv bennett uh this star trek would have died in the 80s yeah it would have died after tmp <laughs> yeah yeah it would have died in the 80s and so we all, he's a he's a guy that doesn't get a lot of shout outs and i i think a lot of people outside the star trek fandom don't know him but you go google him he's a very fascinating writer yeah there you go uh this movie starred of course william shatner leonard nimoy Woo! deforest kelly james duhan walter caney george takei nichelle nichols bb besh Merritt buttrick paul wildenfield kirstie alley and ricardo Montalban. iconic Arguably his most iconic performance of all time. I mean, it's a debate between this and Fantasy Island. I mean, Fantasy Island definitely has more hours. That's what my mom knows him from, yeah. uh -huh. is Fantasy Island. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't watched Fantasy Island, but I'm going to say Khan was better. <laughs> I mean, you're probably right that this is probably his most iconic role. The music in this movie was by uh, a brand new composer, James Horner. Of course, it's Paramount Pictures. The running time is 113 minutes. The Perfect length. The budget for this movie, you want to make a guess? You also have to think about 1982 terms. Um, it was a low budgeted movie. 
Oh man, and I, I I don't know my nineteen eighty two budget. Uh, ten million dollars. You're close. It was twelve. Oh, okay. 12 I thought that million. was too low. Uh, okay. It made ninety seven million dollars. Holy Jesus yep. Christ! <laughs> wow. I mean, it's a great yeah. movie. No yep. wonder they were like, ah, uh, screw it. We'll just let these people make these movies till they literally die. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Brad the Con was a runaway. Wow. Hit. I mean, I yeah. knew it was a hit, but like, yeah. holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's get to the meet cute, Ashley. That is the second part of the podcast where we talk about the first time we did these characters and how cute it was. Jason. Yes. Where did you first see Star Trek 2, colon, The Wrath of Khan? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I will honestly say that this is a movie kind of like The Empire Strikes Back that I just, I just always kind of remember knowing and being familiar with. I would assume that it aired on television at some point in mm-hmm. my childhood and we just watch it. I can tell you that I I remember my first instance with Star Trek is of course the next generation. Yeah. That's the yeah, first yeah. thing of Star Trek I remember watching. And I know somewhere in that I want to say like my mom or my dad was mm-hmm. like, hey, you know, there are movies, too. And I was like, what? There's more. If you don't remember your story, I'm going to ask you to tell one that you told me last night. Sure. Uh, tell the story about when you showed your little brother Wrath of Khan for the first time. Oh, yes. OK, well, well, I, when I was in college and I was going to college in uh, old Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah, like three years ago. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> Jason Zamir, 21 <laughs> years old. <laughs> um, I one time, uh, my little brother was like eight or nine or 10, somewhere in there. And he came and spent the weekend with me. Uh, and I remember that at the time he had been watching like TOS on television, like the remastered ones. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, did you kind of like what my parents did. Yeah. Did you know there are movies? And I think he was like, oh, there are movies. There's more. <laughs> and um, I showed him Wrath of Khan. And I will tell you, I have a very conscious memory of him being like enraptured by this movie. Mm-hmm. Just him being like, whoa, which is surprising because this movie is about old people. It is. <laughs> it's about people being like, oh, you know, James Kirk's like, oh, my hip. Oh, you know, I would say that I think more like, oh, my eyes. Uh, oh, there you go. Fair, fair. The rednecks. I do. Uh, I do think that most of the cast is working at the height of their brilliance here. It's a lot of very good performances yeah. from the original cast. So where did you um, first see uh, Wrath of Khan? As with most of the Star Trek that I've seen in my life, Star Trek would air on Spike TV. They, did they air the Wrath the of Khan network on for Spike TV? They would play the movies all the time on the weekends. Uh, so that was where I first watched Wrath of Khan. Oh. Ah. Did you know, like, see, to me, like, I've always known, kind of like Darth Vader. Khan, yes. Darth Vader is always, I've always known him as Luke's father. I've never had that reveal. I've always known that this is the movie where Spock dies. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Oh, so you were were very surprised. Yeah, nobody in my family watched Star Trek. Okay. (laughs) But I knew, like, Khan, because even before memes, it was like a memeable thing. Like, like the Simpsons parodied it. You know, a million cartoons parodied it. Yeah, so I knew that moment. But no, I didn't know Spock died. Very upsetting. Uh, now, guys, when we get into the main lesson, we're going to be talking about, of course, all the spoilers. We always give we always give away the biggest spoiler, of course, and the good nuggets of Wrath of Khan. But Ashley, I want to ask you, yes. um, Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry actually had little to do with this movie, very almost nothing. But he did write a script treatment for this movie where the Enterprise crew traveled back in time to meet a very famous American in the past. So I want you to think about who that person could be. And we're going to find out. After this. So, Ashley, after the release of the motion picture, Mm -hmm. executive producer and creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, wrote his own sequel. He wrote his own Star Trek 2. And in his plot, the crew of the Enterprise travels back in time to set right a corrupted timeline after the Klingons use the Guardian forever. Oh, the Klingons. Yes. Okay, that changes my thought then. Um, What famous American... Did the crew of the Enterprise meet in the past? Okay, so I'm assuming if they're meeting this American, they have to team up with them in some way, shape, or form. Or to, save their life. To, to defeat the from Klingon. the Klingons yeah. killing them. So the only historical American president that I think could even kind of go toe-to-toe with the Klingons is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> uh, no. Because uh. you have to think about where Gene Roddenberry's head is. Of course, he created Star Trek in the 60s. They met JFK. 
oh, that's not fun. That's not a historical figure. No, it's it's weird. It's also like they, I mean, I was going to do the Hamilton joke, but it felt too contemporary. So in this version, the idea was the the JFK, the Kennedy assassination was somehow prevented too soon to be, uh, look. Yep. I know that's a that is like the tropiest of all mm-hmm. tropes for American uh, time travel writers, mm-hmm. but like too soon should have been. Should have been the bull moose himself. Well, let me give you a little. So here's the intro of this. Gene Roddenberry wrote the 60 page treatment in the spring of 1980. Okay. Now, in the story that for this movie, the Enterprise returns to Earth to find bodies floating in space. They eventually discover that history has been changed by the Klingons. The Federation no longer exists. And as to why the Enterprise still exists, the answer is that anyone traveling at warp uh, when the change of the timeline occurred is immune. And with the Federation never having existed, Earth is populated by a savage race of proto-humans. Uh, so they go to the Guardian Forever, and of course they go back in time and they repair the timeline. This sounds like, if what if Stephen King wrote a Star Trek novel? Stephen King? Yeah, because, you know, like 11, what is 11, 22, 63, 63. whatever. Yeah, like, doesn't that also deal with the death of JFK? Like, it feels like if yeah, someone sat Stephen King down and said, okay, you have to write a Star Trek time travel script that this is what he would have written. Well, this was soundly rejected by Paramount executives who blamed the tepid reception and the cost of the first film on its plotting pace and constant rewrites. Um, As a consequence of this, Roddenberry was removed from the production and, according to Shatner, kicked upstairs to the ceremonial position of executive consultant. Now, here's the thing we need to say. The first Star Trek The Motion Picture was also a hit, but it was viewed as a failure. Was it... A critical failure? I don't know. Okay, that's I'm not fine. Google that's it. fine. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I mean, it is. It is kind of viewed, I think, in the canon as a failure. I it think is. people are warmer on it now. Yes, but well, I think because they expected it to be a Star Wars movie, and it wasn't a Star Wars movie. It I, didn't hit Star Wars box office. Was level. was never gonna be. No, that's not what Star Trek is. No, Star Trek has never been that, and it never will be, and it never should be. That's yeah. what we like about Star yeah. Trek. Uh, principal photography of the Wrath of Khan began on November 9th, 1981. It ended in January 29th, 1982. So they filmed this entire movie in three months. The Wrath of Khan was more action-oriented than its predecessor and actually cost less to make because the project was supervised by Paramount's television division and mm. not their theatrical unit, uh, which is another thing. Now, um, the film officially established that this is the 23rd century in Star Trek history for the very first time. Uh, according to Gene Roddenberry, the original series could have easily taken place between the 21st and the 31st centuries, and he wanted Star Dates to allow for an ambiguity, but Nicholas Meyer, in the commentary, I actually remember listening to this, said that he put that up there because he thought that if his dad watched this movie, the first thing his dad would say is, like, when does this take place? So he put in the 23rd century. The original subtitle was Star Trek The Genesis Project. It was later trained to Star Trek II, then Star Trek The Undiscovered Country. Which Ooh, it's you, a good title. Which you can tell is a title that Nicholas Meyer had in his mind, which eventually becomes Star Trek VI. And subsequently, The Vengeance of Khan. Um, this was discarded in deference to Star Wars Revenge of the Jedi, which was also yep. in production. Now... Uh, the third subtitle was eventually used, uh, excuse me, you know, of course, like I said the Undiscovered Country became Star Trek Six. So it's funny, we had Revenge of the, Return of the Jedi was Revenge of the Sith, and this was The Vengeance of Khan. Both movies blinked and changed their titles. That's so funny. So it became Return of the Jedi, and then it became The Wrath of Khan, Khan. Um, which is so funny because you can tell that Lucas saved that title as well because he was like, I'm going to use this Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, we've seen a lot of studios do that recently, too, though. Yes. Uh, Producer Harv Bennett, as I mentioned earlier, viewed all the episodes of the 1966 Star Trek and chose Star Trek Space Seed as the best candidate for the sequel. Um, Spock even remarks in the script that this would be interesting to return in 100 years or so to see what type of civilization had grown there, specifically talking about Space Seed. Um, And actually, fun fact, this is the first time in feature film history that a feature film was made as a sequel to a television episode. And what's interesting about this movie is you actually don't need to see Space Seed. <laughs> no. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about the opening and the death of fake Spock. We start in this movie at the opening of the Kobayashi Maru. This is the incident. It is three Klingon cruisers, which is footage from Star Trek The Motion Picture. They're saving money, people. And we see Savik, played by Christy Alley, and they all die. 
They all die. Spock dies. All this stuff like this. Uh, Ashley, what do you think about this opening? It feels very long by a contemporary standard. Um, also, because we're so used to Star Trek and television format where your like bumper scene is quite short. Um, I like this scene and I like a lot of stuff around the Kobayashi Maru, just a piece of mythology that I really enjoy in the Star Trek universe. And the reveal of Kirk is very, very cool. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a strong opening. It is a very strong opening. Uh, Spock died in this opening scene specifically because rumors had gotten out that Spock was going to die in this movie. Yeah. So they intentionally fake kill him in the beginning so that fans would think that Oh, that's the Spock death that everybody saw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, fun fact, actually, Leonard Nimoy um, refused to come back to this movie until they promised to kill him. Yes, I. that's a very famous story. And then he had then he so... Then he said, just kidding. Well, he had so much fun on the set of Wrath of Khan that he changed his mind. Yeah. You know? Well... He was like, oh, this isn't that bad. I like these ears. The Star Trek team, the OG crew, were some of the first in modern history to deal with playing the defining role of your life as a as a very young person mm -hmm. and what that meant like now now we're we would all kill for roles like this where you would never have to work again and you you could chase this or not chase but you could live off of this clout for the rest of your life it was a very new thing mm -hmm. so i can understand why nimoy and shatner in particular like really struggled with it i mm -hmm. mean we went from i am not spock to i am spock <laughs> Yes, he wrote both of those In books. In terms of memoirs. <laughs> uh, Ashley, let's talk about Savick. This is a brand new character, a female uh, Vulcan in Starfleet. It's unclear um, whether she is supposed to be the second Vulcan in Starfleet, you know, because Spock is the first. But yeah. we do know that she is some type of Spock protege. Yep. Um, I guess she definitely can't be because we saw Zahn, the Vulcan in Star Trek motion picture. There, so you, there go. you go. Um, but forget the problematic actor. Yeah. Let's talk about Savick adding to this movie. What? Do why don't she got Vulcan eyebrows? <laughs> yeah, why don't she got Vulcan eyebrows? <laughs> do you like her performance? Because I said you, I actually prefer Robin Curtis, who plays Savick in Star Trek Three, over Kirstie Alley. Um, I think Savick is a much more interesting character than we've ever seen her executed um, by either actors. I agree. Um, unfortunately, that's... If you want to learn more, go to Memory Beta and uh, read all those Star Trek novels and find out what Savick does. Yeah. She probably yeah. goes back in time and saves uh, the life of JFK. That's what I'm going to bet that. Oh, my God. <laughs> Savick's journey. I do like the idea of, especially because it's an aging crew, of having a younger character, and I like making it a Vulcan, particularly mm -hmm. with what happens to Spock and the Spock storyline. Um, I don't I don't mind Kirstie Alley's performance. I think she's okay. She does. All of her acting goes into her eyebrows and mm -hmm. her forehead because mm -hmm. she's trying to remain very stoic, um, which is a trap that... A lot of Vulcan actors to the modern day fall into. Um, but I I like Savick also because she's kind of an echo of Spock from the series. And Spock is perpetually struggling with his own identity, but she embodies a lot of the same questions that we would have seen Spock ask back in TOS days. So mm -hmm. I do enjoy having her on the crew. I don't necessarily know who at the time I would have cast instead. But she, oh, I, 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 who, I, who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not asking you to like cast 1980. Actors. Leah Thompson. Um, but uh, I, but might I, have been a bit young. I think so. <laughs> Cadet Savick. Uh, but I do. But cast her in everything. Exactly. Uh, or have her direct now. She should have played Khan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if she can make us believe she loves a duck, she she's could... directing Star Trek Picard right now. Uh, that's true. So yeah. she's in the fam. Yeah. Um, I believe that she would stab at thee, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, she can stab me all she wants. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I That's like... That's Marty's mom. Let's not be gross, everybody. No. <laughs> but I like Savick. I think she's an interesting character. She's an interesting addition to, to this, this crew. crew. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also weird because, you know, like most of the TOS adventures... She does get almost she gets a lot more play than like Scotty and Uhura and Chekhov and Sulu. Yeah. Like, like that's the downside about the TOS movies is that those They're Kirk and Spock movies. They're Kirk Spock McCoy movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like the T and G movies, they become data Picard movies. Yeah. Um and DeForest Kelly's having the best time in this movie though. Like mm -hmm. He just seems like he's thrilled to be there. He's funnier than he's ever been. Like, he's a good time in he's this movie. He's always funny. He's like, remember that episode in TOS where he's asking for mint juleps? Uh, is that Shore Leave? Yeah, but no, it's this side of paradise. There it is. Yeah, it's one of those where they go down to the planets yeah, so and, every, and everyone hallucinates. They all get blasted by spores. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. 
Uh, so this is a movie about a midlife crisis or old age. Yeah. Um, Ashley, I know you already know the answer to this. Yes. Um, but the script states that Kirk's age is 49 in this movie, which I did not know. Yeah. And Shatner was 51 yeah. when he filmed this movie. The vanity of him being like, I will not say I'm 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, well, it's funny because Shatner was very reticent about giving out Kirk's age. Now, they don't say it anywhere in the movie. No. Which I think is the smart choice. Uh, but it's fun fact, Kirk's birth date is actually established in canon. It is March 22nd. Woo! Uh, and it's actually on, it's actually, that's also William Shatner's birthday. But Star Trek Enterprise episode in a Mirror Darkly Part 2 on a Federation computer record establishes it to be March 22nd. So as we were talking before, Ashley, that makes him a what in the astrological sense? Makes him an Aries. Yes. And so I want to talk to you, like, is Captain Kirk... A typical Aries. Both Captain Kirk and William Shatner are incredibly Aries. Really? <laughs> Energy. Yeah, Shatner a little bit more so. I would guess Kirk. I could literally do his birth chart because we do know where he's born and his birthday. Riverside, Iowa. Uh, maybe that'll be like some Let's not go paywall that. episode someday. For a fictional uh, character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he gives me like um, water or earth sign rising or moon because he's a little Kirk is more down to earth than William Shatner mm -hmm. ironically enough but that cowboy aspect that's very Aries for sure mm -hmm. it's very like Aries Leo energy uh, but but I only know that because recently I pulled like a bunch of other like Aries geeky characters oh, who are some of the other Aries geeky characters I'm uh, just curious Goku from Dragon Ball Dragon Ball Z okay all, well all the Dragon Balls but I know him from Dragon Ball Z uh, and T'Challa Oh, really? The Black Panther. Is he? He doesn't seem... He's a very calm, chill dude. He is. I would actually probably, if I were picking his astrological sign, but maybe he's if he's at the end of the Aries cycle, then if he's on the cusp with Taurus, that would make a little bit more sense. But he gives me like big Earth side vibes, like very like grounded, chill, in control. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I guess because he's a warrior? Yeah. Look, we all have know Have you looked up Spock? Uh, I have not. I can look it up right now. But also, what? Do they have the same months on Vulcan? Oh, that's fair. But he is half human, so you would think oh, that's that they, true. they when is that, Spock's birthday? They it's the autofill. They would have given him a Earth birthday. Oh, right? there's apparently in the US there is a holiday called National Socks Day, which is what is my first search result. January 6, 2230. I think that makes him an Aquarius or a Cap. Cap. D -d 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 yeah, I am Googling very poor. This is compelling podcast. You're welcome. He's a Capricorn. He's a Capricorn. Uh, Kind of, kind of, kind of. Capricorn's hard headed. Well, also, again, like he was not born on Earth. Yeah. So and also he's half a species that doesn't exist. I guess you can also so. argue, though, that the stars are the stars are the stars. But also is Vulcan in our star system? No. So. Well, technically. Uh, here we go. <laughs> technically. Um, we should be able to see Vulcan from our sky. Technically, are there, is Vulcan not in the Beta Quadrant? Uh, I don't know exactly. It, it kind of is, but in almost every Star Trek series, you can travel from Earth to Vulcan in, in about, like no time, in yeah, four days, yeah, 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 in yeah, yeah four yeah, days. Yeah. So, and that's in Enterprise time, in in XO one time. So when yeah, your yeah, maximum yeah. warp is five times the speed of light. Sure. Okay. If, so if you can get there in four days. So so it's probably <laughs> right on the border of Alpha Beta Quadrant. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, don't let's not even get the, the Star Trek. That's crazy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> uh, as I once heard a great Star Trek writer, Iris Stephen Bear, once say about the, you know, there's that Star Trek stellar cartography map. Yes, yeah, yeah. I heard him once say in an interview, he said, he was like, that is just somebody trying to make sense of writers throwing darts. <laughs> yes, but I mean... Isn't that what fandom is? I know, I know, I know. So you can't really like... <laughs> I know. Amazon's about to do that same thing for the Lord of the Rings entire continuity. Yeah, yeah. It's just writers being like, Perseus 5, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, it is funny. I've seen versions of that map yeah. as well, where you see how clustered some areas become. Or you see like the trail of the Enterprise and it just cr yeah. crisscrosses over itself. And you're like, no military vessel would travel in that path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but again, it's just, it's some publishing person was just trying to be like, oh, how do I make this make? Okay, Vulcan's here. Kardashian. 
nasty is over here. Well, the wormhole has a bunch of stuff yeah. around it too. But look, I from from a marketing and from a sales perspective, I also understand why you make that. Of course, I would buy it. Absolutely. I own it. I know, uh, <laughs> I know, I know you do. Um, let's talk about my favorite scene in the movie, actually, is the scene right after this training montage where Kirk and Spock are, uh, Spock gives Kirk his gift, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of the times. It was the worst of the times. Message Spock. I love how the way he goes. Message Spock. Spock in his best costume of yep. all time. And then uh, because, oh, you like the red uh, naval uniforms of Rathacon. I do. I I'm like, not a fan of them. I like them. If, if, I, if I were in charge of Star Trek, um, I would keep those as like a dress uniform. I like them mm. because they feel naval in a way that a lot of their other uniforms don't. See, that's the reason why I hate them because <laughs> I am of Gene Roddenberry famously hated these uniforms. I'm with Gene Roddenberry because I like the idea that Starfleet is not a military organization. Peacekeeping Armada it's doesn't. A, I like peacekeeping. Armada. Resonate with well, like Armada is a military. I, term. Under, I understand, but I I agree that the uniform should not look military. Well, I like but, them, but yeah, no, this is a, <laughs> for a lot of people. This is like their favorite uniform. I would, yeah, like I don't know. I just think there's something about them that's very striking. They're Maybe it is the red. They're much, much better than the uh, motion picture. Oh uniforms. my god, yes, Those <laughs> weird pajamas. Yeah, 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 where you can see everybody's features. Yep, starkly and, defined. Yep, everybody's stem bolts are just out yep, there. Yep. See, really startling. Um, actually. <laughs> what do you think about the a tale of two cities? Because at the time, Blech. well, see, I like it because at the time, that was not trope or cliche. This is the movie that introduces that into, I think, now we see a million, I mean, even Dark Knight Rises did it. Oh, and no, I hate it because I have no time for Charles Dickens. Yeah. I hate Charles no Dickens. No time for, that's a Broadway musical Awful. title right there. No like, time for Charles Dickens. No Chaucer, no Dickens, useless to no me. No Chaucer, no Dickens. Um, I appreciate that Spock would give him a piece of literature, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's an intelligent choice, but. And McCoy yeah. gives him glasses. He does. Because Kirk is, is is allergic to Red Knox 5 to cure his eyes. He can't do the laser eye surgery. That's a great detail, mm -hmm. though, that actually like drives the plot forward. Because Kirk should definitely be having readers at his age. Mm -hmm. It's coming for all of us. Mm -hmm. It's not a drag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you don't have readers in the 23rd century, Ashley. You do if you're allergic to... Red what, Knox 5? Ret ret retinol. Red Knox 5. Retinol. Yeah. For most patients your age, Jim, I treat Red Knox 5. I'm allergic to Red Knox 5. Hence the glasses, Jim. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they do make him look, and the way they, they perch him on the end of his nose, like mm. Mrs. Claus, like he does look very old when he puts the glasses on. All right, let's talk about the Reliant. We cut to the Reliant. We see Pavel the Reliant. Chekel, Captain Terrell, beam down to uh, City Alpha 6, and they run into the genetically engineered tyrant, Khan Nunian Singh, who and, reveals, and his, and his, this is City <laughs> Alpha 5! And his uh, Muscle Beach crew yes. of augments. <laughs> yes. Um, let's talk about Khan here, Ashley. Um, yes, let's. It's funny because even though Kirk and Khan are enemies, they never meet once in this movie besides through view screens. Yeah. This is very much a submarine mo movie. It's an internal battle. Um, what do you think about Khan? What do you think about the choice of bringing Khan as this villain? Um you know, there's problems to this. There's also like, well, there's problems for the legacy for the legacy of the franchise going forward from this choice. Yeah, there's also like, let's just address like the elephant in the room that is Khan Noonien Singh. Khan Noonien Singh is specifically mentioned to be a Sikh character, meaning yep. of Middle Eastern descent, played by Benedict Cumberbatch. A, <laughs> yeah, a Latinx actor. Yeah, who later goes on to be played by the whitest white man in Hollywood. Like. Yep. That's not great. Mm -hmm. I will give Wrath of Khan a little bit and, and the original Star Trek a little bit more of a pass, just given the sort of ethics and morals of the mm -hmm. time. But like, that's not great. Mm -hmm. um, Khan you know, is, originally in Star Trek and Darkness, it was supposed to be Benicio Del Toro. Do you know that when they cast Coverbatch, he was supposed to be Gary Mitchell? I, I do know that. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah, and yeah. I will uh, die upset about that. Mm -hmm. I will literally pass mm -hmm. away being upset. No, originally about the storyline was Benicio Gary Mitchell. would have been great, originally actually. Originally, the story was Gary Mitchell. Then they switched to Khan. Then they were like, let's get Benicio Del Toro. Then Benicio Del Toro said no. Then they got Benedict. I mean, <laughs> like, there's not a million yeah. South Asian actors yeah. who could play freaking But Khan. let's talk about Rathacon. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. And, and the, the choice to bring back a villain from the original series. I wouldn't have picked Khan. Who would you have picked from from your knowledge of the original series episodes? If you could have made a sequel to one of those episodes, what would you have done? I don't know if this character has a name. Who is the Romulan lieutenant? You have to get way more severe. From, is it Balance of Terror? There's multiple of Romulan episodes. The 
first one where he's got like his foreheads covered. Oh man, him and Kirk talk through the view screen. So I don't know who are you talking about? You're talking about was it, I don't who, think this character has a name. I just think he's called the Romulan. Are you talking about the one that's played by um, uh, Mark Leonard? Yes. The, yeah, I don't think he has a name. That's but that's the he character. He also dies. Oh, does he die? Yeah, he blows up. Oh damn it! Um, <laughs> he blows up. Uh, I you don't... could make it his brother. Yeah, maybe. I, I hate siblings in Star Trek. Though. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't say Trelane. Everybody's favorite Q <laughs> uh, from the original series. I hate Qs. I only love Trelane when he's played by Hal Rudnick. You know. Um, you know, it's interesting because like some of TOS's greatest villains are just these random monsters. Yeah, or or clouds, vapor like clouds, the Gorn, like. Kang and and Koloth, the Klingons, you know, but they you did, almost said Kodos, didn't you? I did. Uh, <laughs> but you know, like I can understand how they're like, let's not do a Klingon movie, and also let's not let's you know. I mean, maybe Khan was the best choice, but he wouldn't have been my first choice. He wouldn't have been my first choice either at all. Like, I, I wonder, but I can't pull another one. From I wonder there. maybe if Ricardo Montalban had maybe made some overtures over the years, being like, hey, if you ever want to have me back, I would love to do it. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but but just just from my knowledge, well, it's Harv Bennett was the one that made the choice to do Con. No, I know, yeah, but yeah. I mean, like the the that could have been made like when the television show was on. You sure. know, what I, he was like, "I'll come back anytime." You know what I mean? Uh, I just think Con is like a kind of a weird choice. He is. Um, let's get some, so interestingly enough. Uh, Con talks about this whole revenge happens because of his deceased wife. That deceased wife is Lieutenant Maria McGivers, who was when Con was revived by the Enterprise crew. In Spacey, Lieutenant McGivers is manipulated by Khan to help him hijack the Enterprise, and then she goes to Khan with his followers to Seti Alpha 5. I think we should have seen her. Uh, I agree, uh, but I think that would have just complicated all kinds of factors, and you know, who knows if the original actress was still acting at the point or anything like she that. She was really good in Spacey, though, because that's a character who only exists in that episode, mm-hmm. and... The turn to loving Khan is so quick and so unearned, and she just goes for it a million percent. Yeah. Let's also talk about the biggest continuity error in possibly uh. all of Star Trek. So, when Khan meets Captain Terrell, and I think Chekhov's a commander at this point, Khan recognizes Chekhov. Now, Pavel Chekhov did not appear in Star Trek until a mock time, the first season of uh, the first episode of season two of Star Trek. Yep. Space Seed is the first in the season. first season. Yep. So Chekhov is not part of the Enterprise crew. Now, there are arguments, and I've always said this in my head canon, that I was like, well, Chekhov was on the Enterprise, but he wasn't in the senior crew. So he wasn't on the bridge. I also think that he was wandering around the corridors. I think it would be a mistake to not have Chekhov recognize Khan. Yeah. Like, that is the whole point of having Chekhov be in the scene. Yes. Uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and Captain Terrell is a much more interesting character to watch in mm-hmm. this scene. Um, I don't mind this continuity error. I agree. He's on the Enterprise. This was a famous event. Of course, he would know who Khan is. Uh, Walter Caney once famously joked at a convention that Chekhov made Khan wait in line at the space toilet lunch, which explains Khan's vivid memory of him. Ha ha, ha <laughs> I guess. Uh, according to the novelization of Star Trek The Wrath of Khan, Chekhov was actually working in security during Space Seed and managed to delay Khan when he was taking over engineering in the original series. And this impressed Captain Kirk enough to offer Chekhov a position on the bridge. That's a nice bit of retconning. I don't mind that. Uh, So we all head to the research station, regular one, uh, by having Chekhov inform Dr. Carol Marcus, the head of the Genesis Project, that Kirk has ordered them to take possession of the Genesis. With the device. hardest hair in this so movie. So Khan has, has he, he's got in charge of the Reliant. He's got this stuff like that. Ashley, let's talk about Carol Marcus and, excuse me, Dr. Carol Marcus there you and go. Dr. David Marcus, the lady and the son of Kirk. Uh uh, the Enterprise has something to say about her being called the lady. Well, that's fair. The Enterprise <laughs> is going to throw down a couple of photon torpedoes right on Carol. Um, um, I have a very question on Front Street for you, Ashley. Okay. If you dated Captain Kirk. Yes. And he gifted you with a love child. Would you keep it a secret for him for 20 years? First of all, this is the 23rd century. You're telling me that. Like birth control is not incredibly easy <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, like planned parenthood is not utterly obsolete. Uh, 
And I'm not. I'm not. In D Space Nine, it's injections. They say it. They actually confirm. There you that. go. They I, say I'm, it's injections. I'm not advocating yep. that like David should have been aborted or anything like that. <laughs> oh boy. But um, no, we're not saying that. No, I would definitely not. I mean, look. Here's my advice. Unless, unless the man is an absolute monster who would kill that child with his bare hands, show some respect. Kirk might. He goes on a lot of strange he missions. He would not. He goes evil. Kirk has turned evil like multiple That's times. That's true. No, Kirk would be the the person I who would let your who would let his child play too close to like the edge of a mountain, and then the kid would fall to his death. Well, that's how you make love to the mountain. To the mountain, you have to. I mean, maybe they would have the rocket boots on, and he'd be fine. The mountain, be <laughs> one with the mountain. That's a reference. Go Google it. The amount of cocaine that must have been in that interview. <laughs> um, no, I wouldn't have done that. I, and I struggle because Carol Marcus is a character that I actually really like. Mm -hmm. um, and I really respect. And I don't think that's an ethical thing to do. And they seem warm toward each other. Mm -hmm. They seem friendly. And, and Kirk knows that David exists. I know. And that's yeah. so to, yeah. to me, like there's. And then somehow, which I this is where the scene where we're jumping ahead a little bit. But the scene at the end, David, obvious, like it's David's best scene somewhere. In his lifetime, his mom told him. Yes. Um, but we're given the impression, I like this is like great storytelling. This is why, like, this is great scripting uh, by Harv Bennett and I forget the other writer. Um, that they let, they make us think that David has no clue. Yeah. For the majority of the movie. I do get a little lost in the ethics of like one, Kirk not being told, and then two, Kirk choosing not to have a relationship because I mm -hmm. don't think Kirk would do that. I really don't. Even if he knew when David was like 20. Well, I, he, he said he respected her wishes. So uh, there is something. Yeah, but that's his child. I understand. I don't agree with that. I don't like it's, it. It's, it's one of my least favorite details about both of those characters. It, it is a thing that it only, it only works in the world of storytelling because it makes it a bit more like yeah. Arthurian almost. I, like um, I understand. Um, I want to talk about Carol Marcus here. Yeah. So, we are presented with this woman that we have never met before in Star Trek history. Yeah. And the idea that this is the woman that captured Captain Kirk's heart. Yeah. Like, it is Dr. Carol Marcus, a character we've never met before. What do you think of Carol Marcus? What do you think of the actress? Uh, hold on. Excuse me. What's her name? Uh, B.B. Besh. Uh, uh, what do you think about... What do you think about Carol in this movie? I really like Carol Marcus. B.B. Besh does a lot with very little on this character. Um, I like her a lot. Um, again, the hardest hair in the whole movie. They do her. The eighties were not kind to uh, beautiful women. Mm -hmm. They make her look a million years old with that old lady haircut. Um, I think Carol Marcus is so interesting because there is a direct line from Carol Marcus to Dr. Beverly Crusher. Really? She, How? How she is proto crusher. Mm, okay. A hundred percent. Like a professional woman with a child who don't need no man, who's at the top of her game, who's an incredible mother. Like she's Beverly is, you know, a, a directly derivative of, of Carol Marcus. And I like the idea because we've seen Kirk have many uh, conquests and many romantic entanglements. I like the idea that the woman who captured his heart doesn't need him and doesn't doesn't want him and also has a strong career on her own. Yeah, she's of she's not a damsel yep. like she yep. is like she's running this incredible station. She's yeah. the head of this incredible project that's going to save his best friend's life. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert for yeah. a forthcoming movie. Well, uh, it makes it, it. I like it that he loves. He like he's I, in love with this capable woman. Ex exactly. He basically fell in love with the female version of himself. That she is like yeah, so, or an analog. As certainly. dedicated as he is to the Enterprise, she is dedicated to science. science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to give you a fun little Star Trek fact that I have put into my head canon about this. Um, okay. So Star Trek fans have speculated that Dr. Carol Marcus is the little blonde technician, exact words from the script, with whom Gary Mitchell admitted to collaborating to distract Kirk with within a oh. romance in the second pilot episode where no man has I know exactly before. who you're talking yep. They kind of have the same hair, yep. and I think I think she's wearing blue. No, no, no. They, they never. I don't think they ever see. Her. Oh, I, I was I like, I, don't know I if thought we saw her, the, her from the but back. But Gary min mentions a, a little, little blonde, blonde technician, technician yeah. that distracted Kirk with a romance. And and to be honest with you, since Gary Mitchell is Kirk was Kirk's best, best friend, head cannon accepted. Head cannon accepted. Absolutely, I love that. Yeah. Let me ask you this, and this is going a little bit off the weeds because it's like a completely different character. Um, I actually kind of liked in uh. Star Trek in the darkness that they brought Carol Marcus back. 
Did they like try to revamp Carol Marcus? I mean, I like that they tried. Yes. Um, but I think try would be the operative word there. I agree. Uh, she is uh, <laughs> somehow way more exploited than she is in the 80s. That's so. fair. Um, all right. So, of course, uh, Kirk and Spock and McCoy get a brief video on Project Genesis where we see Project Genesis basically form like this is what it is. Um, of course, this is. Um, Drum roll, please. This is the first use of computer, a fully CGI sequence in a motion picture. When you see the Genesis planet get reformed and stuff like that. Um, I didn't know this until Jason told me yesterday. And I have to say, mm -hmm. even by today's standards, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's um, so I can't imagine how it must have blown people's minds or how long it took to render at the time. So the special effects for this film were done by Industrial Light and Magic. And this mm. was specifically done by Industrial Light and Magic's animation department. So it's the demonstration of the effects on the Genesis device on the barren planet. This sequence, Ashley, convinced Steve Jobs when he saw this in mm -hmm. theaters to buy the department that made this clip. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, and this department would later go on to become Pixar. Can you also tell the story about George Lucas seeing this scene? Oh, George. They So apparently because um, George, George Lucas owns ILM. George Lucas was working on Return of the Jedi and, you know, they were making the effects for Return of the Jedi. They're making effects for Wrath of Khan. George Lucas, apparently, they showed this clip to George Lucas, and he said, that's an amazing camera move. Yeah. Yeah, which, <laughs> you know, from George is high praise. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I guess, I we, do we want to talk a little bit about Spock's death? Or was that jumping way too far? That's jumping a little bit too far. Right? <laughs> Okay. My notes have my notes have Spock's death like right here, which I do not know why. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit. We're going to talk about this uh, a, a little bit now. So Spock's death in the film was widely reported. It was leaked. It was thrown out. Um, Trekkies wrote letters in protest. They paid for full page advertisements in the trades. Um, and Leonard Nimoy received death threats for killing Spock. This is the 80s equivalent of uh, release the Snyder Cut. Yes, it is. It is. But I just want to throw out that that was out there that people were like, you can't kill Spock. What? Look, I would have been <laughs> I would have been devastated. Mm -hmm. I would have been absolutely like, like Spock is like hands down my favorite Star Trek character, uh, which I know doesn't make me unique. But like I can understand why you would be upset, but also like. It's just a movie. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in your head canon. Um, you know, so we get to the point where the, we have the first confrontation between the Reliant and the Enterprise. Ashley, do you like the design of the Reliant, the upside down Enterprise? I do. I do too. You want to know a fun fact? The Reliant is used for the next 30 years in Star Trek. Yeah. It just seems like <laughs> yeah. it is It is used in TNG and DS9 for years. In fact, most famously, uh, the model for the Reliant becomes uh, is adjusted to be the Stargazer in the next generation mm -hmm. of Picard ship. It is also not even changed at all, besides the name on the hull, to the Saratoga, which is the ship that Ben Sisko's wife dies on. Yes, Jennifer. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of reused assets yeah. in this movie. The space station is flipped upside down. It's the space station from the motion picture. Uh, yep. The Klingon warship. Is the Nebula The Klingon warship's in Star Trek 3. Oh, sorry. Is the, the, is the, the Nebula is also reused? The Mutara Nebula. They... <laughs> What they do is they scrape the Reliant and the Enterprise out of it. Yeah, that's right. And it is, if you go watch the Next Generation episode, The Best of Both Worlds. Uh, it Iconic two-parter. It is the nebula that the Enterprise hides from the Borg cube in. Mm -hmm. It's the same nebula. And I think TNG uses it a couple other times, too. So what I'm saying is reduce, reuse, recycle yeah. extends beyond yeah. the uh, cans in your kitchen and can also go to visual effects as well. That's right. That's right. Um, so we we finally get Kirk and Khan talking for the first time ever. The Reliant blasts the Enterprise right at main engineering and it cripples the Enterprise because that's where all your power comes from in a starship. Everybody, don't you know that? Jesus, did you go to warp field mechanics class? Yes, you didn't. Um, and, you know, Kirk and Khan have their first view screen to view screen confrontation where neither actor ever talked to the other actor. Can you believe they didn't have like an actual fist fight with like the double fist punches? Yeah, they never had it. They did. There's there's no fist fight. Like in two movie. characters absolutely begging to come to blows. But here's the thing. And I blame Marvel on this. Ever since the MCU has become big. Huge since the Avengers, the first Avengers movie. Yep. I'm going to put it 2012. Right there. Um, every franchise, every franchise now leads to the climax is some sort of fist it's fight. It's Jason's favorite part about Star Trek Into Darkness. 
It makes no sense to me. <laughs> and that's the thing about this is that, especially in Star Trek, I don't believe a fist fight is your climax because this is this franchise that is about nonviolence. Star Trek, to borrow a phrase from um, Mission Log, centers around morals, meanings, messages, right? Mm-hmm. Ethics are at the front of this. Um, Strange New Worlds is, in every single episode so far, Captain Pike has been like, we solve our problems by debate. Uh, that's mm-hmm. like the message they are, they are, they are driving home. So... Particularly because we we in the one of the opening sequences, like you talked about, we see Kirk walking around with like a classic piece of literature, the tale of two cities, the best of times, worth of times, um, which also to me exemplifies something that you and I talk a lot about. Like Captain Kirk is a by the book captain. This he is. this movie, that is the thesis of this movie. Um as, this is, as he I, tells Savick several times. This is actually the movie, in my opinion, that introduces the how the I take risk and chances because what is his solution for the Kobayashi Maru? He cheated. But being by the book also means that you know when to bend the rules, sure. which Kirk does. Um, and so it, it makes complete sense to me that they would come to a resolution largely by a discourse. Mm-hmm. I just feel bad for the actors because <laughs> you're reading with either nothing or, or a nice script supervisor who's not giving you anything because they're not an actor. Like, uh, the performances... I don't know whether it was Nicholas Meyer that read against both of them. I can't remember. But either way, yeah. like, you're not getting anything. And and, and it's two great performances by both actors. And Ricardo Montalban is going full ham, uh-huh. eating the scenery. Uh, and I, I love it. Well, as I always tell, I, I will tell Ashley and I will tell our listeners, uh, the Reliant Bridge is <laughs> the Enterprise Bridge redressed. Yeah, which is why they couldn't really yep. be and they, together. They didn't have the money. They, no. <laughs> sh- they shot the Enterprise Bridge first. Yeah, And then they sense. shot the Reliant second. Uh, I heard that Ricardo Montalban visited the set during some of these scenes, but he did. He ne- apparently he never read against William Shatner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and William Shatner never read against Ricardo Montalban. And the hardest thing, I think, for Ricardo... No, part of that also, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're fine. Part of that was uh, Ricardo Montalban's uh, schedule due to Fantasy, Fantasy Island. Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, uh, William Shatner has a whole crew of actors that he's worked with for decades mm-hmm. at this point um, supporting him in that scene. And Ricardo Montalban has that one guy who didn't get credited and a bunch of other extras who don't speak. Yes. So, <laughs> Well, I also love, too, because, again, this is the great scene where Kirk pulls out his glasses and, and they beat... they uh, And he won't let Khan see him in his glasses. At every point, he goes, damn. At every point, Kirk beats Khan... By knowing the Enterprise better than he does, I think because I think Kirk's intellect often gets overshadowed mm-hmm. by Spock being there, but Kirk is no dummy. The prefix code, the idea that like you can tap in a code and you can take control of another Federation starship, is genius. But it also makes sense, right? Yep. Because if an admiral comes in mm-hmm. and you're really messing things up, like they would seize control of your vessel, just like in a naval tradition, you would board and you would overtake the mm-hmm. vessel. Well, that's why, the, the, and Leonard Nemo get, blows this line out of the water. There's a great line in that scene where Spock goes, unless he hasn't changed it, you know, he is quite clever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Nimoy is so freaking good in this movie. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Uh, so we beam down, we get away from the battle uh, because Kirk tricks him and now we're in a, uh, you know, a, a uh, chase around uh, the regular one. They beam down to the station. We see all the people are dead. Spock and McCoy, uh, excuse me, McCoy and Kirk build a rope pulley system and then the lower and raise some bodies for no reason. They I have don't know. transporters. They have also, they have like mag level. They have like floaty platforms and, and they're, they're like, hold on Spock. Hold on McCoy. Let me put a pulley up there and <laughs> pull this rope. <laughs> yeah. This is where the movie tries to do some horror vibes for like yeah. seven minutes. It's kind of strange. Uh, so for the, for a majority of this, uh, Kirk asks for a damage report. Spock reports by the book hours would seem like days and main power will not be available for two days. Uh, which of course con overhears Kirk finds the Genesis device. He finds Dr. Carol Marcus. He finds this like giant cavern full of amazing matte painting, which looks beautiful. So beautiful. He's like, wow, that matte painting looks great. I didn't know Genesis can make matte paintings. And they're like, yeah, we're going to make a lot of money in Hollywood. And Kirk is like, fantastic. Uh, and then con (laughs) beams. the Genesis device away, which leads to the most famous God! It's so it funny. echoes into space. The vacuum of space where sound cannot exist. Yeah, in space, no one can hear you scream. Yes. Um, what do you think about, there's a beautiful scene between Carol and Kirk when they talk about this. Yeah. And like, Kirk is, David tries to stab Captain Kirk or Admiral Kirk. He doesn't know that it's him. Yeah, David's a walking bunch of daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> he very much is. Even he's probably like 26. 
I mean, at least. Yeah. Uh, He's and, in his late 20s. And it's wild because Merrick Buttrick just like looks like a Ken doll. Yeah. Like he looks like a doll I had growing up. Yeah, and he's in a jumper. He's so handsome. Yeah, he's, it's like they, they like refashioned one of the uh, motion picture jumpers and they're like, get in that. I always wondered if they intentionally cast him because he's a very soft man. Mm-hmm. Um, So the character of David comes across much more like Carol than like Kirk. Mm. I think they cast him because he's blonde. I mean, he is blonde and handsome, but so like he looks like Carol, and also but it he been, looks like he looks like classic. He does look like Shatner. Shatner, but he, it could have been so easy to have a real like Han Solo, Captain Kirk type of Chris Pratty kind of attitude guy, That's and fair. instead they've gone the opposite. He's very introspective. That's fair. Uh, until he tries to stab his dad. Um, what do you think about? So we're gonna talk about. Eventually, we get to the point where you know Kirk is like, I feel old, and and Carol's like, I'm gonna show you this cavern. We and then he eats the space apple, and Savick says, please. For God's sake, for Vulcan's sake, tell me how you beat the Kobayashi Maru. I've been bothering you about this the entire movie. You got to tell me. I kind of find it charming that she can't let it go. <laughs> um, this is one of the, well, because it doesn't, it betrays logic to her. Yeah. That somebody could have beat it. Yeah. Um, but it's petty. It's yes. a very human reaction. Mm-hmm. And um, there's something, there's a nice touch that in Star Trek 2009 that J.J. Abram does where he, when we see the scene where Kirk beats Finger the Kobe Mashi Maru. Mm-hmm. He's eating an apple yeah. just like this scene. Yeah. Now, I am a big believer that the Kobe Yashi Maru is overused in Star Trek now. It um, is very much overused. I think so. I do enjoy it, though. Jason also hates the idea that Spock created it. I do. I don't believe that a test made of emotions and about emotions and character would have been built by Spock. But like Devil's Advocate, Spock is pretty emotional and it's the one retcon that doesn't i understand why you do it for the movie but i don't i don't have any real feelings about it that but t- i think it's interesting that it bothers you it does not exist in my headcanon that's fine um that's the great thing about headcanon yes um so yes so we get to this point and then we find out that of course uh, which i don't buy because they say the idea that they this idea that con or excuse me kirk has never lost like I'm, that's just not true well if you've watched TOS, at all it's like not true so many crewmen have died in TOS. Yeah, like Kirk has had personal loss. Kirk. Edith Keeler, his true love, died in the city on the edge of forever. Like Kirk has failed at numerous things. Like I understand the line, but mm-hmm. it's just badly false. Well, I think we're go- we're trying to like really. Um, we're splitting hairs. We are. We are. Um, so he beams back up to the Enterprise. We get a chase through the Matara Nebula. Beautiful. Where it's like these ships are just going in circles back and forth, up and down until eventually, um, you know, uh, you know, Spock suggests that Khan's thinking is two dimensional, which is very interesting because every th- fight and battle, even almost to this day in Star Trek, is almost two dimensional. Well, I think it's because we haven't, most people haven't been to space and they don't understand. Um, the Expanse does a really good job actually at playing with this that in space you can also go up and down. Yes. In addition to side to side or front to back. Mm-hmm. Um, I liked this detail as well because of the sheer number of times we've seen um, Spock playing 3D chess. Mm-hmm. I, so I like that line. Yeah. Um, so we basically get to the point where Kirk, um, blasts the Reliant pretty good. Khan activates the Genesis device and they, they get the information there. And of course, Spock is like, we can't, we got to go to warp to beat this thing or else we're going to die. Yep. And Scotty's like the main line or the line. I can't remember what it is. It's like the, the main, it's the line. The main line is like broken. The mains, they keep calling it the The mains. mains. Uh, Very I don't know. The warp drive is very inoperable. Um, and this leads to Spock running to the engine room. He uh, nerve pinches Dr. McCoy and says, remember, and then he goes inside. Now, Captain Spock, yes, he's a captain in this movie, his mind meld with Dr. McCoy was not in the original script. Uh, Nicholas Meyer also did not direct the scene. This was added after test audiences said they wished there was hope that Spock could be revived. Uh, when Paramount studios ordered this change Meyer threatened to take his name off the film uh however according to Leonard Nimoy's autobiography I am Spock Harv Bennett approached him during the original filming of the scene and suggested doing a mind meld with bones as a thread that we could pick up in a later film and it was Nimoy who suggested the single word remember now also the end credit scene that we see where we see Spock's pod is on the Genesis planet was also a reshoot because of the test audiences. They yeah, filmed it in LA. <laughs> no, they filmed it in San Francisco in Golden Gate Park. Oh, that's Park. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, With some extra ferns. Yeah, Nicholas Meyer did not film it. He didn't even edit that cut. He he actually said that he was like, ah, I'm fine. I was fine with it. Whatever. Look, I'm going to say uh, Nicholas Meyer was wrong. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's a great moment between uh, Spock and Bones. Yes. Uh, So let's talk about Spock's death. I love one of my favorite shots in the entire movie is the empty chair. Yeah. Uh, When Kirk looks over and Spock's chair is empty. Uh, I saw a lot of people share that image when Leonard Nimoy passed away. Very sad. Uh, Let's talk about Spock's death. Ashley, your favorite Star Trek character of all time is Spock. So let's talk about this scene. It's a great death. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is one of the best pop culture deaths. It's one of the best like death in stories. Like forget about Star Trek. Like it's an excellent death. It might be one of the best. I would argue it might be one of the best movies of deaths in motion picture history. Yeah. So much so that Hallmark made it into a Christmas ornament. Yeah. That's what I want to celebrate. <laughs> the, the irradiated corpse of my best friend. Yeah, exactly. Um, the green makeup is really well done and mm-hmm. the peeling prosthetics is really well done. I love the detail also in Spock's makeup that they always paint him a little more yellow because he has green blood, not red blood. I've always loved that. But it's understated. Leonard Nimoy plays it really straight he's Mm. not overly emotional which you could have you could have done the take where a vulcan gets panicked and emotional in death sure but i really like how restrained it is um and i think that echoes in shatner's delivery of the eulogy later um it makes me teary-eyed every single time i watch it but of all the characters that i believe would sacrifice themselves Mm -hmm. it's spock like absolutely him following the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few it's Mm -hmm. it's poetry it's art uh, I have been and always shall be your friend, your friend is like an amazing line. The one detail that I don't like about it Let's hear. is when uh, Spock puts up the live long and prosper mm-hmm. and Kirk just puts up his hand. I think he should be echoing the live long and prosper. Oh, see, no, to me, that is the perfect of Vulcan and human. Yeah, to me, I guess I'm like, if someone's dying, you give them what they need. So, like, if someone is dying and they say, pray for me, if you're not religious, you absolutely pray with them. William Shatner famously originally uh, wanted this to entirely be in silhouette and to not be able to see anything of Leonard Nimoy. No, wrong. Exactly. Wrong, so wrong. Uh, But I will say. I mean, if this was on stage, that would have been a cool take. But no. In my research, I also found that that chamber apparently was almost airtight and they had to poke. uh, They had to put like several air hoses in there to pump air into Leonard because Leonard kept getting lightheaded. That's awful. Yeah. <laughs> that is deep. Yeah. Like, why was it sealed? I don't know. I <laughs> like, don't know. I don't. Who do you in, like production who built that? I mean, to me, I'd be like, just build the door off camera. <laughs> yeah. Just make it three walls. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but apparently it was almost completely, completely air. That's awful. Uh, here's an original thing uh, in. This is actually in the movie script uh, in the movie script. Uh, Dr. McCoy says before this whole speech happens, he goes, he's dead, Jim. Yeah. And DeForest Kelly feared the line would draw unintentional laughs. Think, does he say he's dead already? No, no, no. It's Scotty says, sir, he's dead already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so Bones just goes, no, Jim. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, we get Spock's funeral. He gets blasted away. Uh, Kirk, uh, you know, like, listens. To, we all listen to get to listen to Scotty uh, playing some amazing grace on the bagpipes which apparently was james Duhan's idea i love a bagpipe um and you know we see the birth of the genesis planet now because the device has sucked up the matara nebula all the people that live in the matara nebula they don't get to enjoy it anymore but they're all dead they get to enjoy the genesis planet and kirk softly quotes the last two lines of a tale of two cities was the best uh, uh uh is a far far better thing i do far far better thing um and upon mccoy's inquiry he goes young i feel Young. And then we, I, this is one of the things that I love. We get to hear Leonard Nimoy give finally yeah. space, the final frontier. He's a captain. So, yep. and they change the lines. Technically, for this movie, Spock is the captain of the Enterprise. Um, is this the first time where it's not gendered language? Uh, no, they say no man. Oh, okay. No, it's T and G is the first time. They okay. do, they do change a couple of lines in it. They, yeah. They, there's like a, there's like, instead of new life, it's like, it's something else. And yeah. Yeah. But yeah. no, this one still says no man. Boom. So, uh, yeah, it's not until, uh, T and G that, that changes where no one has gone before. Yeah. All right, Ashley. Um, let's talk about who do we think is the best actor in this film? Leonard Nimoy. Jason. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's really hard to beat Leonard Nimoy in any Star Trek film because one, I think he's the best actor among the cast, uh, certainly among the standard cast. Um, also because Spock has a lot less range to play with. So the fact that he's even compelling at all is quite something. And this is Spock's movie. Uh, emotionally, he mm. shows out in this, like the death over shines everything else in the movie. It's the thing everybody knows. 
it's believable and it's emotional. So like it's absolutely Leonard Nemo. Like no question. Jason? I completely disagree with you. Uh, cool. Who do you think is the best? It's William Shatner. Okay. This is, it's so funny to me that like, this is Kirk's movie. I mean, it is presentationally, but the thing everybody knows about this movie sure. is it's Spock, like it's but a Spock death. We, we, we know that and we love that because we see it through the lens of Kirk. And Maybe. this is the movie that I would show anybody. Yes, there are some lines here and there that do not work. That's but, just because of time. But. I think Shatner's performance in this movie is the reason we remember this movie. This mm. is the reason why we think Captain Kirk is cool. This is, yes, it has, good, of course, the con is, ah, it's ridiculous, but it's memorable. No, but it's great, though. <laughs> but, like, when he says human yeah. uh, during Spock's line, it's just, like, it is mind-blowingly heartbreaking. This is this is the movie that I'm like, anybody that says William Shatner's a bad actor has not seen Wrath of Khan. Uh, I would also make the, you, you could make the argument if you want that this is his last truly great performance as Kirk. I, although I, I think there are moments of brilliance in the other ones there. I agree with you. I think he has some moments in three. I think in all the rest of the movies, he has moments. I think he has moments in three, but you know what? I think you might be right that this might be his last, like overall. Yeah. Like solid, A plus performance. A plus yeah. performance yeah. is Kurt. It might be this movie because like, there are some moments in three, but then also three has the, I ha, ha enough of you. But there's also like, there's also great moments in like, um, generations. There are, which there, is a silly there movie. are some good, movies. I actually do like, Kirk. I don't like the way he dies, but I yeah. like his final line. Yeah. I, I think uh, Captain Kirk's final line being, it was, it was fun. fun. Yeah. Is a, is a fan. Apparently that was Shatner's idea. Yep. Yep. Very famous story. Um, Oh, and the oh my, him being like, oh, oh my. my. Um, no, I think it's William Shatner. I, I do think it's this movie does not work without William Shatner. And William, I think William Shatner carries most of this movie on his back. I actually think Leonard Nimoy kind of just gets to sit back and relax until his death scene. It's the best for, scene in the a, movie. A, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. Um, Look, that's also Spock's my favorite. It's I have a huge bias towards Spock, sure, which I will. I, I will definitely admit. But I mean, even when we rewatched this last night, like I was sitting here being like, man, anybody that thinks William Shatner was never a good actor is a fool. This, oh, absolutely. This, he yes. is yeah. fantastic yeah. in this movie. He's fantastic in a lot of things. Yes, he is. Uh, he's amazing in Boston Legal. Jason uh, loves Boston Legal. We talk Legal. about Boston Legal all yep. the time. Fine. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, if you listen to any of our Patreon pods, you know we're big fans of Boston Legal. Anyways, it's on Hulu apparently. Uh, actually, what's the legacy of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan? Does this movie hold up? What do you think, like, yeah, first, does this movie hold up? And what is the legacy of this film? 40 years later. Yes, 20 out of 10, it absolutely holds up. Mm -hmm. um, its legacy is being one of the best, if not the best, Star Trek movie. I think maybe depended on your taste and the types of stories that you like. Well, we when we admitted at the very beginning, objectively, this, yeah. I think, I don't know if there's any question that objectively this is the best Star Trek movie. I mean, even people who haven't seen this movie, they know like, Khan, they mm -hmm. know Khan with the bare chest. And even the tings in the ears, mm -hmm. the worms. Uh, and they know Spock's death. Yeah. So like, those are kind of the most important things in the movie. So most and people. And I would think a lot of people probably even know, even if you don't know where it comes from, I think if you hear Kobayashi Maru, you might be like, that's a Star Trek thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think most people know the broad strokes of this movie uh -huh. um, and its impact in cultural history is, oh, we're sure going to bring Khan back a lot. Yeah. Um, rather than chasing villains of the same caliber as Khan, we're just going to redo Khan a whole bunch. Um, and we're also going to redo the death um, mm -hmm. and deaths in this style yeah. going forward. So... There's a lot of good lessons that are lifted from this, like the exploration of filial bonds is something that I really love about Star Trek. Um, but there's a lot of like really lazy tropes that come out of this movie as well, unfortunately. I agree. I agree. Is that it? No, you know, you know, I was waiting for not, you to not going to say something else. I was going to wait for you to tee up the ball for me. Jason. Actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, this is a two hander podcast. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say that the legacy of this film is that. This is the movie that popped, I think, Star Trek into mainstream. I agree. I think it's this movie. Um, I mean, it's certainly not TMP. It's not. Uh, I bet a lot of people went and saw TMP that were not Star Trek fans, though. I, I would agree, um, yeah. Because Star, you know. Like and, uh, Serenity and Firefly. Yeah, I think this is the movie. Like this, you know, a lot of people talk about like, oh, man, Star Trek's for nerds. And it is. And Star Trek's not cool. I think this is the movie that sort of made Star Trek cool for a while. I agree. Um, especially like, I feel like most people in the mainstream went and saw the TOS movies in the eighties. Like when a I TOS so, movie came, yeah. you went and saw it and, yeah. it. and it wasn't until the 
T in TNG, the next generation came out that, that people started like going away from that again. And then I think the Abrams movies brought people back to it. I think now people will go to a Star Trek movie in the mainstream. Um, the legacy of this film is one, this showed what the power of what you could do with this franchise and how so emotionally resonant you could make something. Because like as much as this is a story about two guys shooting photon torpedoes at each other, this is really a movie about aging and accepting mm. aging. That's really what this movie is. It, that, and that's why I think this movie lands on Shatner. It is about Shatner is about Captain Kirk accepting that he is not the gallivanting young man of the galaxy anymore. And he needs to accept, he accepts it through the death of Spock, that he will die one day. And he has to be okay with that. Yeah. Um, and that is the brilliance of Star Trek. Because Star Trek is pew, 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 pew. But it always has that subtext underneath it. Interesting. And this is what that movie has. Now. The downside, this movie totally holds up, by the way. I will say that. Oh, yeah. The downside of this film is that this is the Star Trek film that convinced, even to this day, creatives and writers that Star Trek movies need to have super villains. <laughs> and I don't believe that anybody is a true villain in the Star Trek universe because that's not the point of Star Trek. And people have been copying this movie in various ways for 40 years. And it's time to move on. Is, yeah. is that's the, there's that's the bad part of this legacy is that like we need to just hey wrath of Khan is out there you can watch it whenever you want but we need to stop remaking it yeah because we're never going to beat it you're never going to beat it well it's never going to be new you're never going to be surprised by it exactly yeah exactly so that's the downside of this but overall i think this is astounding i think it totally holds up uh ashley what's the rating i think i know what the rating of one to five bregos brego the intern cat by the way has uh, snuck into the studio he's in here by the way yeah. um one to five Bregos, five being the best. What would you give Star Trek to colon the Wrath of Khan? Five out of five Bregos. Easy peasy. Lemon yeah. squeezy. Five out of five. There's yeah. no debate here. This, yep, is, yep, yep. this is, I can't even tell you a scene I would cut out of this movie. I agree. And that to me tells you that it's a perfect movie. Yeah. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. It's really, really. So I can't tell you a time I haven't watched it and been completely sucked in. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree. And I've seen it several times. I know exactly what's going to happen. I know Spock's going to die every time. Uh, are you sure? I hope. Sometimes I hope he's going to get out of there. Sometimes you hope he's going to die. <laughs> yep. Sometimes I hope he. I, sometimes he gets what he deserves. I'm telling you, he, he deserves to get blasted by the mains and the radiation and the radiation. Anyways, yeah. uh, Ashley, let's move on. That's it for this podcast. Let's move on to the recommended reading. Where if you go to geekhistorylesson.com slash recommended reading, uh, they're going to find some stuff related to Wrath of Khan. Correct? Yeah. Is there going to be anything on here besides the movie and the novelization? <laughs> I mean, just some cool. There's probably a making of Wrath of Khan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have anything specifically. Okay. Yeah, we're going to find some fun stuff to put yeah, on there for you. Go. Let's get to the honor roll. What's that, Ashley? The honor roll is where if you go and review this podcast on uh, Apple Podcasts and you give it five stars, we'll read whatever you want. You can literally say whatever you want. And if you are an international friend, please screenshot it and send it to geekhistorylesson at gmail.com and tell us where you're from. Because we can't see international Apple Podcasts. Mm -hmm. So we have a one brave soul entering the teacher's lounge today. And that is Jay Niche 44 who says, Nerd Seminary. Love the show, love the format and the perspective they bring. They have a way of both sharing their opinions without dogmatic or arrogant. I think it's just say without being dogmatic or arrogant. Not to offer a note. They encourage their audiences to form their own headcanons. It's pure enjoyment without tribalism. Thank you, Jay Mitch 44, for your incredibly sweet review. Jason, what's going on in the teacher's lounge today? Well, in the teacher's lounge, uh, sorry for Jay Nish, uh, it's Tribalism 101. Uh, <laughs> Taught by uh, Professor, Professor Nicholas Nudian Meyer. <laughs> Con Nunian Singh. Yeah, that's, that's a better joke. That's a better joke. Con Nunian Singh, he's in there. He's like, he's like, I'm here to teach you about the worms. I know that was a terrible Ricardo Montalban. I apologize. Um, all right. Uh, don't forget to uh, download and subscribe and listen to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave yes. us a five-star review. Please be like uh, Jay Nish and join the honor roll. Um, Ashley, yes. where can they find Geek History Lesson on social media? And we have a blog as well. They can check out new blog posts every Thursday, correct? We do. You can find us at facebook.com slash Geek History Lesson and on Twitter at GHL Podcast, on Instagram at Geek History Lesson because they have more characters and 
our blog goes up every Thursday. We have supplemental material so that you can see what's going on. We just re- released a summer geek read list and we released a blog about our first experience at Star Wars celebration. So lots of fun stuff going on there. Please follow us on Instagram. You can follow Ashley on Instagram and Twitter at Ashley V. Robinson. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Jawin and if you want to hear more Star Trek talk, our episode of GHO Extra this week is who is the best Star Trek villain? Because Ooh. Khan is a very famous Star Trek villain. We're going to go through a list and we're going to decide who are the best Star Trek villains. And you hear that over at our Patreon at patreon.com slash Jawin, J-A-W-I-I-N, where you get that and two extra pods a month, including... Jason and Jeremy, John about Justice League. We review every single episode of Justice League. And Marvel Club is over there now, too. So yeah, Marvel Club. We're about to swing into some Thor stuff. Hashtag stick around. The final part of the podcast where we make sure you stuck through the plug. Ashley, mm-hmm. uh, we found out what my favorite scene in the film is. It's the scene where Spock gives Kirk his uh, gift, his birthday gift. And William Shatner looks at the weird space janitor because he wasn't expecting that guy to be on set. Uh, what's your favorite scene in this film? My favorite scene in the film, I think, is probably right after this where uh, Bones gives Kirk his glasses. Oh, you like the Red Knox. I and really, he's like, why are we treating your birthday like a wait, Jim? Yeah, I really like that scene. And that's also... You like their 70s casual wear? Yeah, man. Bones looks like he's going to a disco. I <gasps> oh, love boy. it. I love it. Oh, uh, that boy. scene's also echoed in uh, the, the Kelvinverse movies as well with Carl Urban and Chris Pine on mm-hmm. his birthday. And he's like, why are you so dour? It's also echoed in uh, Star Trek Three. Because that's true. They all have the drinks. And I believe Kirk and McCoy wear the exact same clothes. Uh, they, you might be right. And yeah. You, you see everybody else's um, like casual 70s wear. And it's like, oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Woof. boy. <laughs> they were strong choices made. They were. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to Geek History Lesson. I am Jason. Damn the photon torpedoes in men. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson. And Professor Jason, would you please dismiss the class? I will leave you listening to this podcast buried alive.